Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners pregame podcast. Ooh, I heard that one. That was it's because my good. mic's broken and I'm yeah. doing this episode with the AirPods. Ginger ale is the flavor today, boys. Yes. Pre-game podcast powered by Olipop. Mind you. My voice, I apologize. Allergies be damned. I do not like them. They suck. I can't breathe. My voice is gone. My throat hurts. My eyes are I look like I'm stoned. I uh, just look awful. Are you stoned? Uh, I guess on allergies. Yeah, grass, pollen, whatever's in the air. It's miserable. Uh, but yeah, Oklahoma plays Iowa State this weekend. Two and two, Iowa State. Iowa State has uh, played Northern Iowa and won. Lost to Iowa in a barn burner of a scoring match, twenty to thirteen. Uh, lost to Ohio University. The other OU, 10-7 to in another scoring match of a lifetime. And then they beat Oklahoma State last weekend, 34-27, to which I know Oklahoma State may be one of the worst teams in the Big 12 this year. Might be the worst team. Or Yeah, they may be the worst team. But they essentially beat them. Um, I, I don't. I'll let you guys take it. I I don't know what to think of this week's match. I don't know how to think or anything. I just know that Matt Campbell, a once perceived pro, uh, uh, savant, a young up and comer, and now looks to be stuck at Iowa State when he should have taken the jobs long <laughs> time ago. That went yeah. off of his way. Beesh, man. I don't know what analogy you use for what Matt Campbell has done to his career, but he was the hottest name in on the coaching carousel circa 2020 and even 2021 after Iowa State was favored to reappear in the Big 12 championship game. It went seven and six. The, the shine hadn't been dimmed on Matt Campbell as a coach. We're getting about to the point where, yeah, his name is still showing up for a job like Michigan State, but nobody takes it all that seriously. Everybody's looking at guys like Charles Huff at Marshall. Or, I mean, shoot, you, if you're looking in the current head coaching ranks, Jonathan Smith at Oregon State. It's going to be guys like that that are – that have their programs objectively on the up and up that are getting the most buzz for jobs like that one, big time jobs like that one. Maybe Michigan State isn't a big time job, but you get the gist. A a power five job at a program with a history of winning. Matt Campbell has just kind of become an also ran in the coaching ranks. Yeah. would Would a Michigan State still take a stab at him because he knows the area really well? Perhaps, but I can't imagine that's a hire that's going to enthuse the fan base. No, at this point, Michigan State probably needs to go out and get uh, Jonathan Smith more like more likely somebody that has that 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 pop because that is a job that is the job right now that has the most limelight on it just because it is the job that just opened up everything that's around Mel Tucker in that situation. Yeah. It, Normally, you would hear Matt Campbell, Iowa State's name in there, right? Like, you would hear – they would be linked up already. We have not after heard the, a lot of that. After the 2020 season, consider this. There was legitimate talk of Jim Harbaugh wearing out his welcome at Michigan and Matt Campbell being the next Wolverines head coach. Boy, has that narrative USC ever since. Before they hired Muleshoe. Remember, he was like the, the the name, and he turned down USC. So they went directly to Lincoln Riley, reportedly, allegedly, and Lincoln Riley became. It, in what world, guys, is Matt Campbell before Lincoln Riley 
on the pedestals of head coaching ranks. And it was believed that because of what he did with the Cyclones for like a four year span. Right. And and that's, and and that's why I think it it was so popular was because I think a lot of the perception was Lincoln Riley had never been a head coach, never had to bring a program, you know, up, never had to develop a program. It was, it was, Hey, he took over for Bob Stoops. We'll see. And I think that's a lot of the reason why Lincoln left and we don't need to get into that, but it's, need to get out from Bob's shadow a little bit. And I think at least Matt Campbell was like, there's Matt Campbell is the reason Iowa state has had any success. Like there's no, you can't find any other reason. Although I'll continue to say every time Brock Purdy and Brees Hall have big games in the NFL, I start to think to myself, man, Matt Campbell might owe him some money. (laughs) They might owe him some money because I mean, going seven and six in 2021 after they had both, you know, come back, obviously, you know, Brock Purdy came back, Brees, I think that was his third year. So he was coming back anyways. It was like, that was the year, right? 2021, they had these guys in their final year in in Ames, and this was the year they were going to make a run, and then they go seven and six. And it's been pretty lackluster ever since. But if I'm Michigan State, I go after Sean Lewis right now. He was obviously went, Kent State was doing awesome things on offense there. He's done fantastic at Colorado. And you talk about the limelight. Nobody's got more attention on them right now than Colorado. And it's not like he's up for that gig. So I would parlay that into a big old contract at Michigan State. Again, he's been a head coach before. So you get a little bit out of that. Okay. He's a, you know, he's got a little bit of experience with with Kent State. Now go up and Michigan's going to pay through the nose because they just saved a bunch of money on a buyout, a bunch of money on a contract. (laughs) And a lot of people, you know, the we, it came up yesterday on radio, but people are like, well, is Michigan State even a top 30 job? Bro, if they yeah. pay like a top 30 job, they're a top 30 job. Like, it's uh, as simple yeah, as that. Yeah. Like, like it's, it, you know, you can talk about, oh, well, you know, it's, you know, you got to, you know, recruit against Michigan and Ohio State in your backyard. You got to recruit this, that, and the other. You're in a tough, you know, division. You know, you're in a tough conference, all this, that, and the other. Like, bro, I don't care. What does that direct deposit look like? Because if you're willing to pay Mel Tucker money to the next guy, now that you saved on that buyout, hey, sign me up. But I would go after Sean Lewis if I were the Spartans. This would be I, the I, week that this will be the week Sean Lewis either makes or breaks it, honestly. I think. <laughs> honestly, like if they can somehow keep up with Mule Shoe and USC. I mean, isn't that kind of the game that everybody's pointing to right now this weekend? Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, they, I know they shouldn't be, but it's just because it's Dion versus Lincoln and, and I, versus, right. I would I would get the sure. concern over the prestige of the Michigan State job if that program had fallen upon hard times recently and hadn't popped off a good seat. I'm thinking of a job like UCLA, right, where they haven't necessarily been down like Nebraska, but they've just kind of plateaued within the realm of mediocrity for quite some time. Michigan State is a year and a half removed, guys, from winning 11 games. That's not a poverty program. Yeah, I mean, you could argue that Kenneth Walker... Yeah, we kind of got sidetracked there a little bit with the Matt Matt Campbell. You could uh, argue Kenneth Walker is to Mel Tucker. I did it, but... Like like Brees Hall and um, Brock Purdy are to... uh, um to matt campbell it's like did kenneth walker make you all that money because that dude was incredible and yeah, no that, that's who made him all that money like so at a certain point it's like is the program or was it one really really good player um and things kind of broke your way but yes on to iowa state yeah so iowa state's two and two the game is going to be a night game in norman uh the the atmosphere should be popping it seems like Oklahoma fans are a lot, a little bit more excited about things now that there, there, there was a sense of reservation a little bit going into Cincinnati. Like Oklahoma fans believed they were one of the better teams in college football. They needed to see it. And I know there was some lackluster play. I only, I think that's a bad way to say it. I think there was some questionable things that happened on the offensive end 
in the Cincinnati game. But I think also at the same time, I don't think Oklahoma fans are giving Cincinnati their due defensively. And I question for you guys. I know Iowa State's defense is tough. We've seen it. They don't give up a lot of points. Oklahoma State somehow broke through with 27, even though they were one of the worst teams in college football. And Bowman is at the QB ranks, a kid that I've known since he was four, mind you. And they they somehow gave up 27 points to Oklahoma State. Does Oklahoma rebound offensively? Do they do they not have any ups and downs inside the red zone? Because that that between the 20s, Oklahoma is nails on offense and has been nails. They hit kind of a brick wall in Cincinnati once they got inside the 20. There was some red zone faux pas, if you will. Not very good things happen to them against the Bearcats in a game that they probably should have had 34, 40 points on the board, 42 points on the board, and they walk away with 20. Do they rebound this week? And if so, why? If not, how come? I think they rebound, yes. And I think that is largely due to the fact that, A, they're going to be at home, away from that rowdy environment in Nippert Stadium. They'll have a little bit more security. I expect I, – I don't know that mm-hmm. Levy throws the playbook wide open because you do have Texas on the other side. And admittedly, you don't want to get pa- – you don't want to get caught looking past an opponent and you don't want to jeopardize your chances of beating Iowa State to try and hold something back <laughs> against uh, – for when you face off with Texas. But by the same token, I – I have to imagine the running game is more of a factor than it was against Cincinnati, a team that is very strong within the front seven, most specifically the front four. I have to imagine the Sooners are going to run the ball more willingly and more consistently against this Iowa state front than they were able to against Cincinnati. So I I think you see things open up a little bit more for this offense, because I do think they'll be able to establish the run game a little bit more. And I look, I have no idea what's happening now with right now with the backfield rotation. I don't think anybody does, but this is not the star studded Iowa State defense. And that sounds weird to say, but they've had some stars in recent years from Will McDonald to uh, Greg Eisworth in the back end of the secondary. I mean, I, and I'm not trying to say that this is a pushover. Iowa State defense because it's not. John Haycock is excellent at his job. They're well coached. They know how to execute their roles in the scheme, but they don't have the star power that we've seen from this program in years past on that side of the football. And so I'm of the opinion that you get the ball into the hands of playmakers like Jalil Farouk and Andrell Anthony and Javante Barnes and Gavin Sawchuk, then you're going to be able to make headway offensively against Iowa State and should be able to control the pace and the flow of the game and should be able to establish your tempo. Yeah. The the thing about, you know, their defense this year is I think they lead the conference in total defense, but we lead in scoring defense, right? You've seen Oklahoma keep teams out of the end zone because like Satterfield said in his pregame uh, to Oklahoma said, The red zone is about one-on-one matchups. Can you make a guy miss? Can you be better than the guy across from you? And then, you know, the rest of it, the other 80 yards getting down there, I think is a little more scheme-based. So that tracks with Iowa State, whereas Iowa State's not, you know, their their scheme is fantastic, but but they're not keeping a ton of people out of the end zone. Iowa scored 20 on these people. Iowa, that Iowa offense, you know, I think they got blanked by Penn State over the weekend. Um, OSU scoring 27 points is a big deal. Um, they're not like I said the the total defense, yes, they're able to keep some yards down, but if you get down in the red zone, you can win those one-on-one matchups against their 
kind of, you know, just, just less talented athletes than what Oklahoma is going to be throwing out there. Um, but um, the run game, yeah, you guys are right. This I think this sets up really well for Oklahoma to kind of flesh out, you know, maybe exercise some demons in the run game. I think in the second half, through eight carries, they had 50 yards, which was on a, on a per carry basis, tremendously better than the first half. And I think it was because they switched up, started doing a lot of their GT counter stuff, started pulling guys, just really started really getting in a groove there. Uh, I think you see more of that this week. I mean, Ollie Gordon had, what, 121 yards on 18 carries. And I like Ollie Gordon a lot, but that's a big day on 18 carries. So uh, this run defense can get got. Obviously, their style um, is going to try and keep things in front of you. I think it's going to be important that people don't get frustrated with Levy or with Dylan this week about just taking the seven yards, taking the eight yards, take what's underneath, because Iowa State feels good about their secondary more so than they have in years past. And they're going to do the rush three drop eight. Everybody knows it. They're going to pull everybody back. They're going to keep everybody in front of them. They're going to try and limit explosive plays. So as long as everybody can be patient, like I said, including Jeff Levy and Dylan Gabriel, <clears throat> and just take what they give you, I think that they should run the ball well. And I think the underneath and short yard passing game should really thrive, uh, you know, in this game. Yeah. Uh, I, I I said it on the live last night, and I'm going to say it today. I think the uh, running game gets going. The three three five, and I know that they use a lot of versatility, moving the fourth guy up, their, their wheel backer or Sam to the outside. Um it's uh the, the the way they do things is you know pretty versatile you know but it's majority 335 they found some ways to stop the run game via you know rush blitzes understanding Oklahoma's or their opponents tendencies over the years but they've also had some cats on the defensive side of the ball that are in the NFL now that I don't know that they have now, or at least this season. Um, they probably do have some on the roster, but I don't know that they're there yet, if that makes sense. Um, the one thing you're going to have to, and Oklahoma fans are going to have to understand about Iowa State, and you would think at, ever since 2017, they fully are aware of this situation. Iowa State is going to be very disciplined. They're going to be very sound. They're going to have a ton of gap integrity. They're going to be very, very um, just, as I said, disciplined in everything that they do, whether it's in the front seven, the back end of the defense. And then when you add the mind of a John Heacock to the to the situation, that's what makes it difficult for the opposing teams to score on them. It's not this drop, the drop eight, rush three, drop eight. That's all fine and dandy. There's ways around that. You can dink and dunk. Iowa State is a sure tackling team. They always have been. They always will be. That is one of the main things that makes them so good. And I hate to say this, but over the years, Oklahoma has had some good defenses where they're there. There's not a lot of busted plays. Do you know where the busted plays were at? Tackling. Oklahoma couldn't tackle. When you see an Iowa State team, the first thing you think of is their ability to tackle in space. And Parker, I think it was it you or it was Travis? Was it you that said that the the Cincinnati head coach talking about tackling in space and and man on man earlier or was that it was Travis? I was can't Travis. take credit okay. for that. Well, that's exactly what is going to have to happen this weekend for Iowa State to be successful. You better tackle in space. Because if you don't, Jalil Farouk, Gavin Freeman, uh, Tawi Walker, especially, if you don't tackle him in space, and he's hard as hell to tackle in space because he's a bowling ball, if they get going, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. This this Oklahoma offense, we've seen what it can do when it gets rolling. It gets rolling. It's tough. And yeah, they 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 shoot themselves in the foot. I think that's kind of the the drawback, guys. With the go fast, go fast, go fast. Sometimes you go so fast that you shoot yourself in the foot because you're trying to catch the defense off guard that you almost by proxy catch 
yourself off guard. If that makes sense, it's it's very it's kind of a catch twenty two, right? And in the end, though, I still think this Oklahoma squad, this team, is different than last year's. And Oklahoma last year went up there and was quite successful. You know, um, I feel like they're going to be successful this year at home. And I think this team, Levy's offense in particular, handles John Heacock's def- defense a little bit better than Lincoln Riley's did because Lincoln Riley used a lot of intermediate passing and it was very pro style. And when you drop eight, that is like a pro style defense's Achilles heel. If you drop eight and you have to have a quarterback that can find the openings and receivers that are smart enough to find the openings in those zones. Oklahoma doesn't do a lot of that now. It's very, very simple slants, screens, deep balls. And every now and then you'll have some out routes and and some deep hitches and stuff like that. But those aren't those aren't the main base of the offense. So I think this team will be a lot more successful. And I think because the run game is going to get going, going to get started this weekend, I feel like I have a prediction of 42 to 13. And I know that may seem crazy, 42 points on Iowa State. But I was just looking at the defenses, and it feels like this this is going to be the best offense Iowa State's played all season, by far. Really? By far. I was told Kansas's offense was significantly better. Sarcasm? It's an Ian Boyd. Ian, Ian Boyd, Joe. Ian, Ian Boyd. Okay. Um, I, I'm saying up to this point, by the way, they have not played anybody their first four games. They have not played an offense like Oklahoma. No, it's, and that's that's true. I mean. <laughs> so I, I that's why. Excuse me. That's why I think they're going to be pretty successful this weekend. Um, on the flip side, can Iowa State score on Oklahoma? <laughs> that's going to be the. It's it's weird that we're asking that question, isn't it? Like that's dude. It's totally how... different. Like yeah, like this defense. Like there's confidence, right? Like huge confidence. Oklahoma fans, the media were were all like, "Yep, got a defense now." What y'all going to do about it? I think Texas is the team everybody's going, yeah, they'll score on you, dude. You'll get set back in yeah, reality. Yeah, in sure. Two weeks. <laughs> but, like, consider this. Iowa State has no run game right now. They are down to a backup quarterback who admittedly had a pretty decent game last week. They have an abysmal offensive line. And they mustered all of seven points against the other OU gentlemen ohio university so if oklahoma does exactly what they did against cincinnati this weekend and holds iowa state to a couple of field goals like is is anybody going to be all that shocked i would say no people won't be all that shocked and the fact that that's the reality less than halfway through the 2023 season I think speaks to how much growth and how much of a jump there has been and how much the, how much everything that Brent Venables is implementing on the defensive side of the ball and everything that he's overhauled is starting to take root and you're starting to see it on an individual level and across the unit. Danny Stutzman's playing like an all American right now. PJ added Bawara has been a revelation. He's got one of the highest pass pass rush win rates, that's a mouthful, in the entire conference. Woody Washington has been locked down at the cornerback position. Peyton Bowen, just like PJ, playing very well as a true freshman. Key Lawrence has had moments. Kendall Dolby has had moments. Kip Lewis has had moments. There's so many guys across this defense right now that are playing such better football than we have seen from them in the past. And are you taking it with a grain of salt still until they play a team like Texas? Sure. But man, like there is such a conspicuous difference between this defense's level of play, even through four games uh, last year versus this year. Yeah. I mean, 
I I would not be surprised if Iowa State does not get into the end zone uh, on Saturday, simply because, I mean, going into that Oklahoma State game, Iowa State was averaging 16.7 points per game, which was the lowest scoring average of any Power 5 school. Travis and, brought the facts. Yep, so... Wait, repeat that, repeat that fact? That was interesting. Repeat that. So, so going into the Oklahoma State game, Iowa State was averaging 16.7 points per game, which was the lowest scoring total, lowest scoring offense of any Power 5 school. So so with that, you say... Less than oh, Iowa? Less than Iowa. Man, can you... Hey, real quick, do you feel sorry for their state? Like... I was born in they, Minnesota. I've never liked any anything about Iowa. Yeah, no, but I, just I, the fact that they, they don't even know what offense is in that state. No, no, I, I, I do not. But... Anyways, no, yeah. with, with with that, if you were already one of the worst, sure, you had a big day against Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State is terrible. I mean, you, you had an you know an anomaly of a performance from from obviously wide receiver Jalen Noel, who had seven catches for 126 yards by halftime against Oklahoma State. Guys, he's only got like 200 yards receiving for the entire year. And he had a 126 of that in the first half against Oklahoma State. I mean, this is they they made their hay when the sun shine, and 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 the sun is very shiny when you're getting to play Oklahoma State's defense. South Alabama put up what 33. So when you look at their offensive numbers now that you factor into the Oklahoma State game, I treat that kind of as the same as us playing Arkansas State and factoring in our our offensive numbers. And I know that's insulting but it is what it is it's the reality of the situation so um i think i think tawi walker has a massive day um i i think as crazy as it sounds i think this is the day where some people say okay tawi walker's our best running back because he leads the team in carries right now only by two carries but he Mm -hmm. leads the team in he leads the team in rushing yards in yards per carry in rushing touchdowns and the longest yard, uh, the longest run of anybody on the team this year. He had a 30 yarder, right? So that's the longest run. So he's doing it in all kinds of ways. And in the passing game, he's valuable. Among running backs, he leads the t- he leads the running backs in receptions and receiving yards, averaging, I think, over 10 yards per reception. So the guy's giving you what you want from a toughness standpoint. These guys do not want to tackle him. He's giving you something out of the backfield, leading the, leading the running backs in receiving, and he's got the long yards with the thirty yarder, and he's got the touchdowns, leading the team in rushing touchdowns. So, it what's interesting is Parker brought up a great point on the on the radio the other day. He said if Jack Snarnold had was in the games and had Dylan Gabriel's stat lines as it sits right now, everybody <laughs> would say Jack Snarnold stuck. But I'm going to oh flip it and God. say, what if Javante Barnes? currently or Gavin Sawchuk currently had Howie Walker's stat line. They, they everybody, would say, everybody would say, give him, give him, give him the ball more. What are we doing playing all these other guys? Give him the ball more. And that's the thing. It's sometimes if you just, and I, I, I like when, I like when especially coaches say just numbers. I feel like sometimes if we just said numbers, we'd say, Hey, and like blind resume, these situations and said, Hey, who ought to play the most? Well, through four games at least, Tawi Walker, a captain for this game, seems like he deserves the most carries. He's been the most productive with his snaps so far. So I'm I'm on the Tawi Walker train. I think he's earned it. I think if you took the names off the back of the jerseys, I think a lot more people would be on board with it too. And like I said, with him being a captain in this game, there's no way he gets shut out. And here's what's impressive to me about Tawi Walker. He's averaging 5.2 yards per carry, mm-hmm. which should not be the norm. That's pretty atypical for a guy that's got his skill set. He is not super explosive. Right? The top speed that that guy's going to get to is nowhere near the top speed of a guy like Gavin Sawchuk or Javante Barnes. He's not quite a plodding back, but he's close in that he is not going to run away from anybody. He is – who was it was it was Doug Martin, former Tampa Bay Buccaneer Doug Martin, that got the nickname the Muscle Hamster. Yeah, that's kind of what 
That's kind of what Tali Walker is. He's just going to come straight downhill at you. He's five foot nine, 215 pounds, completely unafraid of contact. In fact, I would say most of the time he wants to initiate contact. And so when you're averaging 5.2 yards per carry and your game is straight downhill, bucking the line for a couple yards at a time, generally guys like that aren't going to average much more than four yards per carry. And four yards per carry is generally the uh, the cutoff, at least in the NFL, for running backs that you would consider to be playing at a high level. But for guys that make the downhill game their thing and aren't going to get outside the tackles a whole lot and aren't going to pop off big runs, you expect that yards per carry average to be somewhat diminished. That's not the case for Tawi Walker right now. Again, 5.2 yards per carry over his first 34 carries of the season. I like that. Hey, Sooners fans, we want to thank Price Picks for being a proud sponsor of OU Insider under the Visor Weekly pre- and post-game podcast, along with all other OU Insider media. Price Picks is a daily fantasy sports app that allows you to have fun and win differently than those other daily fantasy sports apps. And here's how. All you have to do is select two or more players Pick more or less on their projected stats and place your entry to start enjoying the perks of prize picks. Look, I started using prize picks just recently, and I'm really glad I did. Just in the last week, I've won 25 times my entry money, and guess what? You can too. All you have to do is go to prizepicks.com backslash insider and type in promo code insider for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, all you have to do is go to prizepicks.com backslash insider and type in the promo code insider for a first deposit match up to $100. You do that and you start winning right now. Just this past week, I won $30. All I did was enter in $10 on Jalen Hurts to go above his projected stats and Baker Mayfield to go below his. It took me 60 seconds and I came away a winner. You can too. Again, all you have to do is go to pricepicks.com backslash insider, type in the word insider in the promo code section and start playing and winning right now. Price Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. He, he does remind me a lot of Doug Martin, that's a really good comparison, by the way. Uh, just physical, very physical, very compact in his body type. Um, very, he's not super explosive. Like, he's not going to break it for 80. Like, that's something that I think is the reason why OU fans want Salchuk in there so badly. Because they all know the second he hits that second level, it's night-night for the defense. Like you were not catching that guy. The only other person in that stadium that's catching that guy in a run is named Gentry Williams. And that's it. That's the two. Maybe maybe a Jaron Canick on a good day or a Jaden Rowe on a good day, but that's the two that could catch him. You know, pound for pound, run for run, if they were in a dead heat. Uh, if, yeah, if he's yeah. if he's trusting his hamstring fully, which he had that play, he is right now. And I, I I've talked. Look, I talked. I don't think his dad will be upset. Me, I've talked to his dad. Yeah, no, that, I, is, I, that is not that is not where they're at with that right now. It's conditioning. Like he cannot go more than five or six plays without being gassed because he was out for like four and a half weeks with his hamstring. Like they wouldn't let him do anything. As a matter of fact there were times where he would be running or doing jogging uh, before practice, just trying to loosen things up and do things. And they would have to pull Gavin back and be like, no, like, no, no, rest your hamstring, bro. What are you doing? Like, that's not how we do this. And he pushed himself to get back a little too early in fall camp. And it cost him, it's cost him some of the season, which in turn, I think as a kid, you're learning redshirt freshman, but he felt the weight of the world on him because all you heard all offseason was Gavin Sawchuck, Javante Barnes, Gavin Sawchuck, Javante Barnes. That's it. After that cheese it bowl, the whole world of college football thought 
Oklahoma had two rising stars. And that's a, that's a lot of pressure for a 20 year old kid to have. And they still, and I think they still do. That's the yeah, thing. they do. And, and, and I think that, I think that's where I th- it annoys me slightly when people are like, well, I promise you, Javante Barnes and Gavin Sawchuck got one foot in the portal right now. I just know it because they're not they getting don't. these kicks. Bro, they're each in their second year, and the backfield is theirs moving forward, and they're going to be first year in the SEC. Like, those are the dudes. And, again, one's coming off a foot procedure. The other one, again, had the hamstring issues. I just think that one play, and and I what the, what you're saying makes total sense. I don't, I don't doubt a word you say. But that play against Tulsa, where he had it down the left sideline and it was a swing pass. And, and I'm like, when I see Gavin Sawchuk in space, I'm like, Who, whoever is even trying to get an angle on him is cooked because Gavin's so fast. And, and, and whether it was Gavin didn't see it or Gavin didn't trust it, he, he kind of cut it back inside a little bit. Like I saw, I mean, I was in section 108. He was going to be running right towards me. I was like, man, this guy's going to turn on the burners and take this for six. And it just, it didn't happen. We haven't seen him in a game since, right? At least get get a carry. So right. with that, but it just annoys me all the people that think, oh, redshirt freshman that you know is 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 fighting for snaps this time. He's going to be in the portal. What? Like it, no. I think I, I think so many fans treat the portal like a boogeyman, and and mm-hmm. also they think that Demarco Murray doesn't know about the portal. Like these coaches are just like, oh crap! I could, I never would even imagine that. Like, no, they think the kids don't have fight in them. They think the kids don't have fight in them. In the reality, they just don't. They don't think kids have fight. And I, and I think that's, I think that's that probably comes from two places. I think either the person saying that doesn't have fight in them, and they think that if I were in that situation, I'd be out of there. Or Mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of back in my day going on where this next generation is just soft. So they're probably in the portal because this next generation, they just quit when the going gets tough. And that's the thing. So it's either reflective on them and their mentality towards the youngest generation or the younger generation, or it's a reflection on their own, you know, willingness to quit when times get tough. So I don't, I I don't, so anybody that's like, yeah, you better play them or they're each going to be in the portal and they're gone, man, next week, man, they're going to like, can we stop it? Can we stop that, please? That that part of the fan base. Can we stop that argument? Well, okay. So on your on that play you're talking about on the swing pass you're talking about over on the left side, the uh, it was, I want to say it was on the OU sideline, and um, so he got the ball, and I've asked the same question you asked. I said, did he not trust the hamstring? And I was told this by multiple people, uh, people that broke down the film, all that type of stuff. So they, 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 and they've even, they know the situation at hand it had nothing to do with not trusting the hamstring. It was instead of trying to just go, Gavin caught the ball, surveyed, started running and realized, okay, well, I surveyed too long and I had to make, he made a guy miss. And then before he could get going, because at the very beginning, surveying too long, the situation, which goes in line with the inexperience, which goes in line with not being in a rhythm, which goes in line to all the things that we've talked about over and over and over of not getting carries, not being able to get two or three. And this, but this goes back to his conditioning, mind you, can't do three or four plays in a row and without being a little bit gassed and feeling like he's going to hinder the team a little bit that it all stemmed to that play where they try to get him open and in space and he stops, looks at the surveys area. Okay. Now I'm going to go. He was still fast enough to go right by the guy got nine yards. And then instead of cutting back in, he just went out of bounds. And that, that was the crux of the situation. And from what I'm told was the situation inside the meeting rooms. Like, Hey dude, just go like, don't think just go and maybe maybe it has a little bit to do with not trusting the hamstring and that's why he surveyed the area i mean there's so many variables you could think of of why you do that but to me it has a lot to do with he doesn't understand the flow of the game right now because he just got in it like they they have not let him just get the ball catch it or get the ball 
and just run into the line and just figure out, okay, okay, I got all the jitters out. Let's do this. Okay, hand me the ball again and let me get in the flow of the game like they tried to with Tawi, like they tried to with Javante, like they tried to with Marcus Major. All three of those guys have gotten in rhythm, or at least given a chance to, correct? I mean, they've got double-digit carries. He does not. And that 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 to me is a situation where, and I think DeMarco Murray is one of the best running backs coaches in the country, if not the best. So I, I, I'm going to say that up to the right up front. But I I think when you're trying to juggle four guys, sometimes there's always that one dude that's left and probably the most quiet. Because I've seen people say, well, if it's not the hamstring, it's got to be he doesn't understand the offense. No. I know for a fact he knows the offense better than everybody else in that room. He's the smartest kid in that room. And that has nothing to do with a bias or anything like that. That's me talking to people in the Switzer Center. There is not that. We're talking about a dude that makes almost straight A's. Like, that doesn't understand the, the offense. What? He's one of the best pass blockers. It, it it all stems back to he's out of shape. And everybody has said that, including Gavin Solchuk himself. He's kind of told people that around the, the program, from my understanding. I'm out of shape. And so I talk to some people that are around the program all the time. They say he's working very, very hard to get back in shape, staying after practice with Schmitty, doing running, all that type of stuff to get back in shape. And once that happens, I, I, I'm I'm pretty positive they're going to give him a chance because they're going to have to at some point this season. They've got to figure out the run game. And again, I keep harping back to this. This reminds me of 2017. Who had hamstring issues going into week four? Rodney Anderson. Did OU struggle running the ball up to that point? Who was the game they played before Texas? Was it? No, it wasn't Baylor. It was, it was Iowa what, State. It was they Iowa lost. State. I don't think lost. it was. Really? It was yeah, Iowa they were State four and one game. going into that game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go back and look okay. at it. Maybe I'm wrong, but I know they played Iowa State. I'm pretty positive they played them before Texas. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought I looked it up the other day, and now I'm going to have to do this. Fact check, fact check, fact I'm, check. I'm already on it. I'm already on it. I'm fact checking you as we speak. You're exactly right. Iowa State was the game before Texas. Boom. All right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, everything kind of lines up. And what happened in this, uh, was it late in the third quarter, Rodney Anderson breaks this 25-yard touchdown run, right, and kind of leans in, dives in when he gets caught, dives into the end zone, kind of going up the middle, um, scores. And then after that, they got away from the run game. Baker saves them with the throw to Mark Andrews with like three or four minutes left to go in the game. OU stops Texas. They play Kansas State the following week. This time they get a bye week and then they play Kansas. So similar, but not similar. What happened that week? Who had a coming out party for the world to see that week? Rodney Anderson. Who does Gavin Sawchuk remind you all of? Just running style, physical, his just the way he's built, his height, his weight. Yeah. I, Rodney Anderson. I think you're going to want me to say Rodney <laughs> Anderson. Yeah, yeah. If Rodney he'll go, Anderson. and that's what everybody said. Even the way he, he can run, he runs like him too. By the way, yeah. Even the way uh-huh. he, in the Cheez-It Bowl, like I said, if we get that Gavin Sawchuk back, absolutely give the guy twenty carries a game. Yeah, if so, did it not? You just show me that Gavin Sawchuk. That's all. That's all I'm asking. Like we just haven't seen that Gavin Sawchuk yet. And I think and we, we will. But we, we haven't talked yet. about that at the Cheese Bowl. Who did he remind you all of in the Cheese Bowl? Like, yeah, we talked about Rodney Anderson. Rodney Anderson. So much like him. And so, this I, to me, I've been saying this for like two weeks. Like, this season feels like 2017. I know you fans are going, oh, I hope so, but I hope they don't choke this one away this weekend uh, because this is a very similar. What was, what was uh, the record of. Iowa State going into that game. I think that would be interesting to know. That would be like a, a deep, deep dive fact check of coincidentals. Let's let I, I, while I'm doing that, by the way, um, Dylan Gabriel, 
does he deserve some of the ridicule after last week's game that he's getting from the Sooners fans? Yes or no? no? Why? No. No. I, I, look, I, why. I, I, I'll say exactly what I said earlier this week that Travis referenced earlier in the podcast. All those folks clamoring for Jackson Arnold because Dylan Gabriel just isn't going to have what it takes to get it done against teams with a pulse, teams mm-hmm. that can actually match up with Oklahoma physically. If you take Jackson Arnold and you put him in the starting lineup for the first four games of the season and you give him Dylan Gabriel's stat line, 79% completion percentage, 14 touchdowns to two turnovers, top 10 nationally in pretty much every single major passing category, we'd all be oohing and on over the guy. Two and two, by the way, Iowa State. Two and two, just like they are this year. Two and two. Oh, in 2017? Yes. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Travis. Dylan Gabriel. So, yeah. <laughs> I think, Parker, if, you know, and, and I, I do like the take. I, I think if I think if we saw those mistakes from Jackson, I think people would chalk it up to freshman mistakes. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, freshmen are going to make those mistakes from time to time. And I think with Dylan Gabriel, he's played so much football that I think they, I think people are like, well, he shouldn't be making those mistakes at this point in his career. And sure, some of them, absolutely. They've got, they've got, they've got a leg to stand on in that argument. But like with, with people who want to hate on Dylan Gabriel at this point, because I, I think it's far past critiquing because you can put, you can say, you know, they, they can say why they don't think he's any good and then you bring facts to the table and that refute their reasoning that they just laid out their evidence that they just laid out and it doesn't change their mind right it doesn't change yeah. their opinion of them and when so they'll lead with something and say well you know he can't do this and then you say actually look here's film <laughs> stats here's everything of him doing this and they'll say well you know the standard around here like so the people I, I, I've switched my opinion on this whole Dylan Gabriel thing, guys. I, I, I've switched my approach. When a house burns down, they don't just try and put it out and leave. The fire marshal comes and he investigates why the house burnt down, right? Mm-hmm. They don't just, you know, spray it down, leave, go on to the next thing. They figure out why the house burnt down, right? Was it a candle being left on? Is there a new burn your house down challenge on TikTok that the kids are doing something. They're going to investigate it. Well, to some people, the house is burnt down on Dylan Gabriel. They're just not going to like him. It is what it is. We're never going to change their opinion by now. So I'm not even going to bother with trying to convince them. But I think it's a more worthwhile conversation to say, why, why do these people, you know, dislike Dylan Gabriel? I think, I think it's two things. I think it is revisionist history of Baker and Kyler and Jalen and Sam and Josh and all these guys. I think yeah, those guys missed throws too. I think it's revisionist history and they think those guys never had bad games. Like I said, Baker Mayfield's maybe his most iconic game is that Tennessee game. He went 19 of 39 with a couple of picks. Like Dylan Gabriel would be run out of town if he did that. Now I know there were late game heroics, but there were also late game heroics by Sterling Shepard. And by Zach Sanchez when he picked off Josh Dobbs. Dylan Gabriel has games where he performed light years better than Baker Mayfield did in that game. But the defense didn't hold up. So they lose to Kansas State last year. They lose to Texas Tech last year where he throws for 450 yards and six touchdowns. But Dylan Gabriel's not a guy that can go get you a win like the guys in the past. Well, how many games late did the defense actually come up with a big play, right? Steven Parker did. And again, Zach Sanchez did. And Trey Brown and these kind of guys, they came up with big plays late to win games. And that's not what happened last year for Dylan. And I think that's used against Dylan as he's a game manager. He can't go out and win you a game. Well, yes, he can. It's the defense has to give you a chance eventually. So, again, revisionist history is one reason why people seem to think, you know, Baker and Kyler and all these guys, they were the ones that never had a bad game in their careers or never missed a pass in their careers. And I think Jackson Arnold's the obvious other reason, right? Everybody says, hey, five stars behind him. Let the five-star play. He's, he's more talented. He's this, that. There's a reason he's a five-star. There's a reason the other guy was playing in G5. But, but that, that ignores 
how much mental, the mental aspect of Jeff Levy's offense. Every single play they run is RPO. You've, mm-hmm. you've got, you're either keeping it on a run, you're handing it off on a run, or you're throwing it. And you have that. And in Jackson Arnold's own words, after, after week one, where he went 11 for 11, he said, what impressed you most about Dylan Gabriel's performance? And he said, his decision-making. He made really good decisions. It wasn't big arm, this, that, the other. And then he they asked, hey, Jackson, you had a big-time performance. What did you see that you could improve on? And he said, my footwork and my decision-making. And that's the difference. Is Jackson Arnold got a more talented arm? I think most people would agree with that. Who's the better decision-maker right now? And who gets – O, puts OU in a better position to win right now, it's still in Gabriel because of the decision-making with the offense. And if at any point time you were to make that switch like right now, then what are you saying to the rest of the team? Saying, hey, look, I mean, this is Dylan, G- Dylan Gabriel's locker room. 4-0, yeah. tough luck, dude. Come sit over here on the bench by me. Yeah, you, you, are, you are telling the team, it's more important for us to get Jackson ready for the SEC than to accomplish any of our team goals this year. And that is a very dangerous precedent to set so I, I'm, I'm done trying to convince people that Dylan Gabriel is a good quarterback there are some people that house is burnt down I'm just going to put my farm fire marshal hat on and figure out why it is all these people seem to hate the guy okay so with the whole Dylan Gabriel thing and this is kind of a weird analogy but y'all have watched the Chappelle show before right sure remember the player haters ball did that not what it is? Like every one of those people are like in the crowd of the player haters ball. They're 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 buck nasty, right? Like and it's I hate you, I hate you, I hate everything about you and your mama. You know, like they they cannot get past their disdain for something they don't even understand why they hate. And then, like you said, the ex- explanations that are given. And then when you give the rebuttal, that is even more educational and informative than their reasoning. And they'll try to bounce that off of you. Just there's no reasoning in it. Like I got friends, like, and I don't think my buddy DPZ, Damon Parks would, would uh, hate me saying this. He's a, he's the most irrational fan I know. And I haven't talked to him in probably a month now or three weeks but he's so irrational about things like in there's the majority of the fan base is like that. And it's not a bad thing. It's what makes Oklahoma fans, Oklahoma fans. And what it's what makes college football fans, college football fans. But at some point you have to just sit back and go, man, and there's probably a reason why he starts. And if you think Jackson Arnold didn't come in thinking, I'm going to try to beat out Dylan Gabriel, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. He's going to say, I'm fine sitting back behind the guy, but he's pushing him each and every practice. And in my opinion, I think the fact that Jackson's on the roster has made Dylan that much better because he's been pushed all off season, all fall camp. And I think we've seen a different Dylan Gabriel this year. Like some of the things that Dylan's done this year, he did not do last season. There's he he wouldn't even attempt to run with his legs last year. And I understand that they didn't have a backup quarterback and all that, but we we have, we see a different side of him. He tries to get out of the pocket. He runs around. He he's a little bit more aggressive in what he does, and the offense flows better because of it. Because they understand that he's going to use his feet a little bit and not stand there like a statue and just take shots. So I I, I I don't get it. I understand he fumbled inside the 20, inside the five um, last Saturday. Would have been 27 points on the board, 28 points potentially. I understand that they struggled some on offense, but there was drop passes. There was missed blocks by the offensive line. And, and yeah, by the running right back there. on that on that fumble, Marcus Major whiffed on the guy that ended up hitting. Dylan. Correct, and he could have walked into the end zone if he, he makes that block. Like they're up, they're up three touchdowns at that point. Like, see that that's and that's the thing. Like people see the outcome, they don't see the reason for the outcome. It's all on number eight. He's the reason why that didn't happen. 
even if he's not a part of the play, the handoff wasn't quick enough, man. Like that's why we got stuffed on fourth and one, uh, or the offensive line didn't block or the running back missed the hole. Like other things happen besides number eight being out there on the field. And I know that's like a absurd analogy, but I've seen some absurd things. I've seen things on OU Insider and even on Twitter where they're calling for Jackson Arnold to start like right now, 4-0. and Like, it's almost like they forgot 2022 happened and they were 6-7. and seven. Do they remember, excuse me, how shitty that offense was without Dylan Gabriel last year? Does anybody remember what happened? They got a goose egg and they put up zero points. Zero points without him at quarterback for six and a half quarters. What are we doing? Yeah. Like what what's going on? And 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 none of us, I believe, none of us are saying that Dylan Gabriel's been perfect. We just no, we just don't understand why he's expected to be when A, nobody else on the whole team is expected to be. And I think I think it's natural. I think the whole reason we have quarterback wins, you know, is people saying, "Oh, well, this guy, this quarterback has this record." Right, well, I mean, it's quarterback wins are, are a stupid stat, um, and it's like the the defense since it doesn't have like one guy touching the ball every play. Like I think responsibility maybe gets spread out or it gets laid at Ted Roof's feet. Uh, mm-hmm. Like it's often like it's blamed on whoever's in charge of it. Whereas Dylan, that's the guy. But none of us are saying that Dylan Gabriel doesn't deserve criticism or that he's been perfect. Like, yes, he deserves criticism. He has been perfect. But if <laughs> if, if Dylan's if Dylan's critics, we'll call them, held themselves even close to the standard, the the delusional standard that they hold Oklahoma quarterbacks, they would be rage tweeting about the Oklahoma football program from a yacht in San Tropez. Like if they held themselves to the same standard. So like, that's, what's crazy to me is there, there are other, there are other quarterbacks around the country. I mean, everybody watched Oregon blow out Colorado, right? You know, every time they pan to the student section, every single person it felt like had, you know, a bow shirt or, you know, bow, you know, painted across multiple people, bodacious, bow this, that, the other. It's like, I'm like, I literally, I was like, I, I my, my jaw hit the floor. I was like, I can't they even They hated imagine. him last year. But I can't even imagine Dylan Gabriel getting that support from our fan base publicly. Like, and I know it's probably just the loudest people on Twitter and in the mm-hmm. in the replies probably to this video that are going to be the loudest about Dylan. Everybody else, he's still, every time he's announced, you know, before a home game, he still gets the loudest cheers. And so maybe we're just maybe getting hung up on the the loud minority as opposed to the silent majority that does absolutely support Dylan Gabriel at every turn because he's the quarterback at the University of Oklahoma. But it was just kind of jarring to see, because I think I was fresh off like, you know, a post-game show maybe where I was like, oh man, everybody's talking this, that, and the other about Dylan. And then I turn on, you know, or I get on Twitter and look at the the Oregon game and everybody's in Bo t-shirts and Bo this and Bo that, and we love Bo and Bo's. I'm like, oh, one day. And- they hated him last year at Oregon. Like they did not think he was very good. They think he, if y'all remember, like he was despised at Auburn. He was despised at Oregon. And then this year, because he started off so hot, well, he ended last year so hot and started really hot this year. Now he's like the savior. But I think, I think the hating also comes with the territory of being the Oklahoma quarterback. Absolutely. Follow, I, I was talking to, uh, player's dad over the last few weeks and they asked me that They're like what is with the hate and i went down the line and talked to him about josh heupel jason white uh brett Bomar, paul thompson uh sam bradford landry jones and then trevor knight blake bell they got hate just like dylan and, and Jackson will get hate when Hawkins and Zerbro get on campus, and they yeah, will get hate like, once or Barry scary. gets on campus. I mean, yeah, like it's never ending cycle. It's gonna happen. Yeah, it's gonna. Ha- it's just a, we it's hated a Brent Venables. Cycle. Yeah, I mean, yeah, oh, yeah. The same fans that love BV now were the ones pushing him out in 2011 when they had a top 30 defense. 
because it wasn't top 20 or top 15 like they were used to. It's all because the OU quarterbacks have been so elite for so long, for two decades, that it is it is what it is. All right, um, before we close this out, let's do our pregame picks, our players on offense and defense of the game, our predictions, and then uh, let's go down the line and predict a few games uh, for this week in college football because it's such a good lineup. I think fans will want to hear our takes on that a little bit, and then we'll close it out. I uh, I said it last night on the live, and I'll reiterate it. I like Oklahoma 30-10 to 10 in this game. I, if that's indeed what you get, I imagine some folks would be bummed that the offense only scored 30. I think six scoring drives is more than enough, and 30 points ought to be enough to win you a football game. I think it's more than enough against this Iowa State team. Uh, so I'll take the under, but I'll take Oklahoma to win and cover 30-10. to 10. My offensive player of the game is Andrell Anthony. I expect him to be the lead dog in the Sooners receiver room again. And I say that as the founding member of the Nick Anderson fan club. So that just tells you how impressive Andrell Anthony has been through four weeks. And Dylan Gabriel's starting to look to him as the go-to option in the passing game. Defensively, I think you see truly an emergent performance from P.J. Adebawara. And I think he, uh, especially with Brent Venable's comments earlier this week about how they need to get him on the field more, and how he needs more snaps. I think there would be a concerted effort to do that, and I think he's just going to eat against an Iowa State offensive line that is not good, not good at all. Go ahead, Travis. Well, uh, I'm going with 38 to 9. I think that um, I think that Iowa State gets three field goals. Uh, I think they are kept out of the end zone, just like we did with Cincinnati. Uh, I think we rush for our probably largest total of the year. I think Tawi Walker leads the team in carries and in yards. Um, Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I think Nick Anderson, you know, I know, I know Parker, you know, touched on it, but what I like probably most about last game is what we'd seen from Nick Anderson is downfield, right? Just go like you're, you're, you're faster, you're big, you're strong, you're tall. We'll throw to you. What I liked last week is they brought him across the formation and kind of did almost like an Andy Reid style situation where, you know, his touchdown catch was this weird kind of not quite shuttle type situation where they had Drake Stoops, you know, taken out to the left. So to say all that, they're getting, they're wanting to get the ball in his hands and be more creative with him. And I think when you start to see them explore other routes and other options with a receiver, I think it I think it's a window into hey we want to scheme things up to get the ball in this guy's hands specifically. So I think Nick Anderson while while they're going to drop eight and we may not have a massive day of just bombs raining from the sky, I think I think you'll see him involved in the short game even more this week. Yeah, so I'm going to go with Jalil Farouk and I said this on the live last night. I think he has continued I've, ever since week two in that play where he just an unbelievable run after catching just a simple crossing route and the the tackle he broke, uh, the juke, and then to get in the end zone to really start to set the Oklahoma offense to get it going a little bit more. He started to have better and better games each week. And so um, I'm going to go Jalil Farouk. I think he's going to he's going to have a big play or two. I think he's going to have a big kickoff return as well. I think that is ultimately what makes him my player of the game. I think he scores a receiving touchdown, and I think we start to see the Jalil Farouk that we all expected this season. So I'll go there, and then on defense. I went with Peyton Bowen. I think he gets his first pick of the season on Saturday. And I've said it and I'll say it again. When that happens, the floodgates open up and that dude, he leads the team in pass deflections as it is. So I think he has three, four, five, something like that. Like he has been dynamite in pass coverage. 
I think eventually, I think he finally gets his his break. He's dropped two two interceptions. He catches this one, and he gets his break, and the floodgates open, and uh, that is my defensive player game. All right. Oh, and the score, 42-13, by the way. I think Oklahoma just gets going on offense. I think they took to heart what people are saying about them offensively against Cincinnati last week. It feels like OU fans don't really respect the top 50 overall defense that Cincinnati is. Like, they're a good defense. By the way, there's seven top 50 defenses in the Big 12 right now. Seven. Interesting, right? Like, that's not, that's not, Big 12 is not known for defense, but they're playing some defense this year. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that, and I think Dylan Gabriel in the run game, obviously, I think the run game gets going, and that is ultimately what takes place. And 13 points seems like a lot, but I think the last touchdown, I think the ones hold them to six, and I think they get a garbage touchdown at the end of the game to make it look a little better than it is for, the Iowa State offense, which I think the OU defense shuts them down completely. All right, real quickly, let's do this week's college football games. Um, Tomorrow is a good game. Utah, Oregon State. Oregon State favored by three and a half. We'll be on Fox Sports 1. Who do y'all got? Oregon State is at home, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's what what tips the scales for me. I actually like the Beavers. and we talked about Jonathan Smith earlier in the podcast. Uh, he's, uh, which the, I, I think he's going to be probably pretty eager this off season <laughs> to get out of the pack two. So whatever head coaching opportunities are thrown his way elsewhere, I'd imagine he will be a hot name as we mentioned, but in the meantime, uh, and in the interim, I like this Oregon state team a lot. I don't think they're uh, national powerhouse i don't think they're a college football playoff contender but it's fun to see a school like that that's been down for so long start to get back mm-hmm. to winning again and i think they can topple utah at home i'm going i'm going utah uh to win that one uh probably probably because i i like them to i've said that i like them to be the new king of the big 12 when we leave uh so i'm probably just emotionally picking utah um, I think I think no back-to-back conference champion has gotten less respect or attention than Utah has. When you when you talk about the Pac-12, all you hear is about Dion and USC, and obviously Washington's putting together a great year. But Washington State's looking good uh, despite beefing with Lee Corso, I guess. Um, Oregon State looks good. Like like there's a lot of good quarterback play out there. And nobody seems to talk about the top 10 team that's just won that conference the last two years. So um, I like Utah. I like Utah as well. I do want to give mad props to Oregon State for a essentially conference-less team and program and university to have the upswing that they've had in such a tumultuous time for them as a university and the athletic department. It's pretty remarkable, to be honest with you. I mean, what, what's been done there is just phenomenal. But the, the fact that uh, I, I believe uh, Cam Rising uh, could be back this week. If not, I think Nate Johnson has been really good at quarterback for them so far this season. And I think that's what tips the skills for me. And I, I just think Kyle Whittingham is just one of the best coaches in college football. The fact that he has not left Utah just baffles me at this point, but he obviously loves it. He runs that university. So uh, I'll take Utah. The Mike Gundy effect, if you will. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good comparison. All right. USC at Colorado. USC is favored by 21 and a half in Boulder. That's an early kick as well, by the way. I like USC to win the game, but not to cover. And I just – I know Colorado got hit in the mouth last week against Oregon. I would imagine they're punching back this weekend, ready to prove that what happened up in Eugene was flukish. 
even so that USC offense led by Caleb Williams is just so overpowering that mm-hmm. they're going to score virtually at will on Colorado. I expect Colorado to score enough to stay within striking distance, but I do like the Trojans in this football game, and I think it'll be a Big 12 circa 2018 type of football game, if you know what I'm saying. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, I agree on that. We didn't agree on the last pick, but we are in lockstep on this one. I think it unfolds exactly like that. I think USC gets enough stops to build that big lead. I I mean, I think Bear Alexander probably has a decent game. Colorado is awful, awful in the trenches. So I think that gets exposed a little bit um, by uh, by USC. But again, I neither team can tackle. You know, it's 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 very much like almost a you know to throw it back that Oklahoma Texas Tech game where it's like they're they're both have dynamic quarterbacks that can put up big numbers, but one team's just got a little more talent everywhere else as well. And uh, yeah, I think USC wins but doesn't cover. Yeah, I'm going with USC. I think Caleb Williams goes off in Boulder. There's a history between those two that I'll uh the dates back to the seventh grade, eighth grade Under Armour All American game where Caleb got injured because supposedly there was like a blitz or something to that effect that you're not supposed to do there. And he got hurt on like the first play of the game. And so this game I believe has been circled in the Williams household for a while. I I don't know. This is just something I remember being told back in the day when they were at Oklahoma. Um, So this, this would be interesting. Uh, I think, I think it'll be fun watching Shadur and Caleb go at it. But at the end of the day, I think Solomon bird and his four and a half sacks for USC I think he adds to that a little bit with that weak Colorado offensive line. And I think they take care of business and I'm going to pick them to cover actually, because I think Shador throws a pick or two because of the pressure from bear Alexander and Solomon bird. And um, I feel like uh, they got a few guys in the secondary uh, with Covington um, right and I'm trying to think who's the uh oh my god, the safety that's been so good for him for the last year, number seven. Actually. Um, is that who it is? I think he gets interception. Every time I watch USC, he ends up with a pick. So I'm uh I'll go with that as well. Uh, but I think they cover. No score, just cover. All right. Georgia going to Auburn, I think it's an interesting one. 14 and a half point favorite are the Bulldogs, but they are going to be playing in the Plains. Who y'all got? Does 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 Georgia cover, I think, is the better question. Yeah, I, I like Georgia to win cover. Okay. Auburn. Auburn got taken behind the woodshed mm-hmm. by Texas A&M last week. So I'm hard pressed to believe even at home that they're going to keep pace with the two time defending national champions. No, Georgia by a million. Yeah, I'll go Georgia by a half a million. Um, I, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think this is the game where Georgia kind of wakes up out of their sleepwalk and say, okay, this might be somebody, this is, you know, an SEC opponent that we might have to take seriously. And then they, they turn on the switch again. I mean, Auburn got beat by an A&M team that didn't have their quarterback. Um, and I don't know. I just – I'm just not real high on Auburn, and I think I think it's the perfect storm for me of not being high on Auburn and just waiting for Georgia to unleash their immense talent in, in a game that seemingly matters on the national stage, and I think this is when they do it. Yeah, I, I think Auburn punches them in the mouth early. And like you, Travis, I think that wakes them up. And the sleeping giant now starts to become the raging giant and absolutely demolishes Auburn. So, yeah, I think they cover. This is one's for you, Parker. Michigan at Nebraska. Nebraska <laughs> is a 17-point dog. <clears throat> I don't Ooh, think that... covers. I'm going to say it right now. 
I don't really think Michigan covers. I do not think Michigan. No, you're talking about the team with the best scoring defense in America right now. Against uh, it all, I, 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 this is my bold prediction of the week. I don't they think they cover. They win. They be, I don't think they cover. They might be the only team that has had a a weaker schedule than Oklahoma up to this point. To be fair, Parker. Fair enough. Okay, that, and that may be true. I'm still taking Michigan, and I think they cover as well. Let the hate flow through, Parker. Let the hate flow through. For the I have no hate. Like, like, oh, come on. I see it here. <laughs> like, Michigan is excellent on both sides of the ball, especially on defense, and Nebraska has no juice right now offensively. No, as long as – as long as long as uh, what Sims is still playing quarterback at Nebraska, Parker is he still playing this week? Uh, no, they've made the switch to Heinrich Harburg. Who? Okay, yeah, Michigan covers. <laughs> yeah, I don't care. I'm going bold prediction. They don't cover 17 points. I, if I'm wrong, whatever. I don't really care either. All right, Kansas at Texas. This is this is Texas's Achilles heel. They've been the thorn in Texas's side for years now. Yeah, at one point it was always a joke. Well, you lost to Kansas. Those jokes don't work anymore. Kansas 4 0, 24th ranked team in the country, going down to Austin and Daryl K. Royal Stadium. Kickoff, 2 30 p.m. Texas, 16 and a half point favor. I do not think they cover. That's a big number. Yeah. I think that's a real big number with Jalen Daniels. So I agree. I think Texas wins. Um mm-hmm. agreed. But I think it I think I think tech I think Kansas has the ball late with a chance to at minimum backdoor it. High well, no, tie the game. Like I think Kansas is gonna be in this one late. All right. I'm going out on a limb. I'm Ooh, doing this for the what? people. I'm doing it for the people. Lance Leipold stays undefeated at DKR. Kansas gets it done this weekend. That would be hilarious. I'm sorry. I would just die laughing. Missouri at Vanderbilt. This is only the reason why I only picked this game is because of Missouri fans probably watching this. And hello. Um, (laughs) So they're still watching, hoping to hear that. uh, Does does Williams Winery visit Oklahoma this weekend? For an unofficial visit. Um, They're a 13 and a half point favorite over Vanderbilt. Do they cover? Do they struggle? They struggled against Memphis last week. Do they struggle in Nashville? Yeah. I mean, I I don't think they cover. I mean, I... I I came very close to picking this game as my outright upset in the ref Royal rumble this week, Travis knows. Yes. Uh, but yeah, look, I don't know if Vandy wins that game. I do expect it to be a close one though. Yeah. I do expect them to hang with the tigers and yeah. but it's like credit to Mizzou for a four and zero start. It's a lot more than I expected from them. That schedule is about to get real tough. Yeah, I think they could lose seven. In real a row. tough. They could seven very well start five and zero and lose the final seven. When you look at that schedule, mm-hmm. they could they could legitimately start five and zero and not win a single game thereafter, because that finishing kick that. is brutal. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I think, I think Vanderbilt makes it close. Agreed. I agree with y'all. Missouri wins. Vandy makes it close. All right, three more and we're done. LSU at Ole Miss. LSU is a two and a half point favorite. Again, it's in Oxford, Mississippi. I'm going to go LSU. I think they're starting to figure some things out offensively. Defense is not very good. It's not very good. I watched no, that. no, it's game. not. Ooh, it's rough. And I'm, I'm torn on this one. I think I'm going to go LSU as well even on the road, I just feel slightly better about LSU right now than I do about Ole Miss. Slightly. I I think that Ole Miss bounces back after an Alabama game and wins this game. 
at home over an LSU team, like you said, that defensive coordinator is not a good coach. Simple as that. Like, I think that Lane Kiffin is going to put up a lot of points. And I think Lane Kiffin just has a Nick Saban problem. And I know a lot of people have Nick Saban problems, but like, it seems like him specifically, no matter Ball what super. advantages he might have, or anything, I think he's just snake bit with, with his former employer. But um, I think that, I think that, that Jackson Dart and Ole Miss get it done at home against LSU. All right. Um, Two more to go. Notre Dame at Duke. Notre Dame's a six-point favorite. It is a 6.30 night game on ABC in Durham, North Carolina. I want so badly to take Duke in this game. I I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I like Notre Dame in a close one because I think that loss to Ohio State last week, I think that's going to have them (laughs) punching back with a vengeance. So – I really, I really want to see Duke sustain this run, man. I want to see him keep it rolling. I just don't know if they have what it takes to get past Notre Dame. Duke, Duke, I, I almost pulled out my Duke coffee mug today just for this pick for this segment. Who you got, Travis? I've got Notre Dame. I think Sam Hartman, while his maybe his Heisman hopes were dashed last week against the Buckeyes. I do think Notre Dame wins. And I think the sneaky difference in this game is I do believe that Marcus Freeman will be playing 11 men on defense this week consistently. So um, I think that's what what tips the scales in Notre Dame's favor. Okay, we're going to be keeping track of all this. or I'm going to be keeping track of all this. And uh, the winner, we have to buy the winner something at the end of the – and the fans get to choose. It has to be something within like a hundred dollars or something. Uh, the winner uh, gets something at the end of the year. So, y'all let us know what should be bought in the comments uh, for the winner at the end of the season here. All right. Finally, South Carolina at Tennessee. Tennessee is a twelve point dog or twelve point favorite. Excuse me. Six thirty p.m. kick on SEC Network. I just guys. I'm going to go South Carolina because I'm not sold on Tennessee. I think they've got problems. Well, keep in mind, Tennessee is the one team that Spencer Rattler absolutely destroyed last year. Last year. Yeah, I know. I think – Which I think, makes it hard. Like, it makes it hard for me because Tennessee is at home this time around. Mm-hmm. So you got the Rocky Top advantage. By the same token – Spencer Rattler has been a lot better thus far in 2023 than he was in 2022. Mm-hmm. So I probably lean Tennessee, but only slightly. I'll go with the balls. I'll take yeah, Tennessee. No, you game. know what? You're right. I'm going balls. That's a good point. I'm going balls. I'm going to go balls. I had South Carolina in my head just because, but I, I forgot how bad they beat them last year. And I mean, they scored 63 points. They beat the brakes off of them. So, Yeah. This is a revenge thing. I think it's close, but I'm going to go false. What do you got? I mean, it really comes down to which Spencer Rattler do you see, right? Because that's one thing about, you know, OU fans. It was, we always knew him to have so much arm talent. You know, we, we'd see him go out and make those five-star flashes. And we're like, oh, once he, you know, play, gets more reps, once he plays more games, you know, kind of his his low moments will be brought higher, but you'll still have those highlights. I mean, it's a game-to-game basis. You're not really sure. Like, he hasn't been as consistent as a lot of people had hoped that you would see through, you know, maturity, growth, you know, just more reps, everything like that. I do think that this is one of those highlight weeks for Spencer Radler. I got the Gamecocks and Shane Beamer. All right. Um... There you go, Sooners fans. Real quickly, we have a few announcements real quick. If you're at the OU game this week, we will be announcing on Twitter the exact time. We will be announcing the exact place. If you're an OU Insider VIP member, come and join us at our inaugural tailgate on Lindsay Street. 
I think it's going to start around 12, 1 p.m. That's the tentative start time. But hey, you get to meet Parker. You get to meet me. Probably travel, so stop by and say hello to everybody. Brian, our uh, ex-coach, Jesse Crittenton will be there. Some recruits have said they wanted to stop by and say hello to Parker and I. Um, some of the parents of players will stop by. If you're an OU Insider VIP member, you can get in. If not, all you have to do is come to the tailgate. I'll give you a little uh, promo code that you can go and you can type in and sign up. Show me that you're now a member of OU Insider, and we'll give you a free 30 days or whatever to start. Write your name, write your email on a little slip of paper, throw it in the bucket that we're going to be doing a drawing. We're giving away five, five free year memberships to brand new signups on Saturday as well. And on top of that, the first hundred people that join us where there's going to be free food, it's bring your own beer, but there's going to be free food. There's going to be TV. There's going to be college football going on, community, communion, all that type of stuff's going to be going on. We're going to have some fun. We're going to watch football and we're going to talk about Sooner sports. And you can talk to Parker and I about stuff that we can't say on air. There's that too. So, Hey, Get to come join us, get to come meet us, get to see a personality that you don't get to see on these mics and on this computer screen or or your through your airwaves. Uh, we're a lot different off that. So come get to know us. We want to know you. So come get to know us. Uh, have some fun. And uh, come join us at the new OU Insider tailgate this weekend. All right. If you're not a VIP member, go sign up. $9.99 right now. Like it's perfect. We're giving away... Four members are winning a pair of Iowa State tickets right now. That ends, I uh, probably won't actually get to hear it, so I shouldn't have said it, but it ends at uh, 3 p.m. on Thursday. So uh, if it's out, it's out. If it's not, it's not. I apologize. But uh, either way, come join us at the tailgate. Go sign up because we're giving away more free home game tickets throughout the season. Uh, you're going to be inside and in the know when it comes to recruiting, team news, all that type of stuff. Also, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. We're trying to get to 15,000. We're over 12,000 right now. We can't thank you guys enough. We're so blessed to be able to do all this stuff. All right. For Parker Thune, for Travis Davidson, not Jesse Crittenden. I hope that's not going to be in the box this time. Uh, my name is Brandon Drum. That's going to do it for this version of the OU Insider under the Visor Pregame Podcast. Powered by Olipop. You guys have a blessed day.